Hey, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight, but before I get started, I'm going to make you all do something uncomfortable. Get up from where you are and go meet somebody you have not met before. Say, Pastor Daner made me come over here. Well, we are going to have a fun night tonight, I hope. All right, one more thing. Everybody look back at uh, Al Bloom walking in and say thank you. Thank you, Al. Al went and jumped somebody in the parking lot, so that was my time to start. So tonight, we are going to have super fun tonight. And so I have a few rules for tonight. You're going to see my nerdiness come out, and so, uh, but I, I, this is my promise. I promise you for the first half, this is going to be very informational, and you'll take some things with you, and I hope tonight helps you. Then later on, and I'll give you a chance to get out of here once we're a half hour into it or so, I'm going to get very nerdy, and then you can leave if you want, because it's going to get deep, but that's okay. So um, tonight is something that... Uh, um, I love this stuff, and I want to help you tonight. Hear me out and hear me close. I am not here to sell, as I start this message, I'm not here to sell a translation. I'm, I'll just say this to you. There are, the ones that I'm going to share with you are all safe and good. So I'm not here opinionated. I'm not going to give you my opinions on this. When we get to the place of, of a study Bible you should use, I am going to sell you on something. And that will be the only thing that I sell and give my own personal opinions tonight. But um, this is a, um, we're going to dig deep into how we got the Bible. Um, can you trust it? Is it reliable? Is it true that people say stories are passed and that changed? And has God really preserved this thing? And I'm not going to give you my, what I think about it. I'm just going to give you the facts and you'll see it very clearly. But then we're going we're gonna to first open up in a part of, of what the translations are in English. Now, let me, let me say something very clear. When Jesus was alive and when they were writing the New Testament in the days of the apostles, English language was never an issue because nobody spoke English. It wasn't until the 1500s when somebody said, we need to get a translation in English. Nobody cared. Nobody spoke it. So you'll hear all sorts of crazy starts, but I'll give you where we started in the 1500s, and then I will take you back to the biblical days, and we'll walk through. And it'll be very self-explaining, and so um, let's just pray, if you will, with me. Father, we love you and give you glory tonight, and spark us, God. Speak life into us, God. I pray tonight, God, that you would uh, help me, God, that I could be in a place where to impart and that you open our understanding, God, to get a grasp on, on the Bibles and the translation and the study Bibles and then the Scripture, God, that we would all grow in the knowledge of you, having a deeper understanding of you, and we will give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. I'm going to start with very practical. I'm, I'm actually working backwards in my notes, but I did this so it would be easy for us to get started. Number one, what, what type of translation should I use? When I talk translation, I'm talking from a King James to a New King James to New American Standard to an ESV to whatever those different translations. I'm just going to give you the reality of these. Hear me out. The ones I present to you at the very first, I think they're all good. So you use what you want. The translators were amazing. The scholarly level in England and America from the 19th century forward have been amazing. These are smart dudes and smart girls that have worked on these things. It's accurate. You can trust them. 
So let's start with number one. The first time, really, that the English Bible became a big instance, the Bible was written because Rome, because the Catholic Church in the West, or what we call it West, you had the Greek Orthodox on one side, you had the Roman Catholic Church on the other side. The Bible, Jerome in the fourth century translated the Bible, it's called the Latin Vulgate. Vulgate means common, so it's the Latin common language. So the Roman church held that translation and kept that translation intact. The problem was then they started saying nobody else can understand it. So you have to let a priest speak it. And that's wrong. That is horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. And so men decided later on, finally, we need to get this thing out of the Latin. Why are we preaching Latin to English-speaking people? And so men and women gave their lives so we could have the scripture. So I ask you to cherish it. I can't tell you how many stories of horrible stories of Wycliffe. They, 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 they did horrible things to these people who translated. These people gave their lives so we could have it in English. Part of the problem was they didn't have all the material we have in. We now live in a society where we've went back and found Greek translations. We have found where people wrote in the first century, in the second century, in the third century in Greek, and we actually have that. It's now in computer form, and everybody could see it. In the 1500s, they didn't know what was back there, so they were just using the material they have. Does that make sense? So there were, there were some Bibles that came forth. A few men tried to try. Now, listen, there were no printing presses, so you know how it got translated. If you've ever tried to write, just go through and edit a book. It's horrible. You start missing commas and periods and extra S's and all sorts of things. And so, you know, there, it, was, it was a very tough process. But as they began to translate this, so there were, there were a few people giving their lives. Then they would actually take some of those translations, like Tyndale's translations. They actually found a whole bunch of them that him and a bunch of guys had worked on, and they burned them all in a big fire. Can you imagine? You worked. 10 years of your life, and they burn every one of them. When they actually burnt Tyndale for writing it in English, they burnt him at the stake, and his, his cry was while he was burning in the flames, was God open the king's eyes. It was his last words, documented proof. It was right after that that King James was put as the leader. So he had two factions of people, two factions of the Anglians who were a big part of influencers, of of a whole society. He had all these people fighting over what translation to use. And out of political reasons, he said, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get all you guys together, and you guys are going to put one English Bible together. This is where we get the King James Bible, written in 1611, okay? Hear me out, Christians. Please hear me out. We sometimes get nerdy as Christians and think something's holy that, like, we get weird. There's people that get weird over the King James Bible. Jesus did not speak King James. <laughs> Am I slamming the King James? No. If you like it, continue to use it. It's good. It's reliable. It's okay. It's fine. It's safe, okay? I'm not a, but don't sit and say, well, and I'll show you tonight. Don't sit and say the King James is the only Bible you should read. That's ludicrous. It's just insane. It makes no sense at all. And we'll talk about that. So the Bible, King James. First, hey, Jeremy, thank you for all the hard work back there that he's done and helped me put this together. So the King James Bible written in 1611, what you don't realize, there were multiple revisions that were done. So actually for centuries they were reworking it and putting it together. Now hear me out. I am okay if you use the King James. I'm not against the King James. Everybody understand? I say this because it's going to sound, the next thing I say, it's going to seem weird. <laughs> but the language they wrote and they used at that day was excellent and good, but the language has changed since then. We don't speak like that. As a matter of fact, even in America, you go to Baton Rouge and they speak a little bit different than we do. <laughs> right? And I mean, and so I mean, everybody speaks. English, but so it's changed since the 1600s. Does that make sense? So I'm just going to give you a little example of how the English language has changed. You can go online and look at this. There are actually over 600 words that they used in the King James that I don't even think we hardly understand today. All right, I'm not against King James. If you're using it, you like it, baby, hang on to it and use it and read it every day. 
it's good, it's safe, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it, okay? Jeremy, if you do. So the first one, I just took one letter of every alphabet. I hope it's okay. You may need to move forward if you can't see. I can't see. Worth a nickel. The first one is in Mark 1.30. And, the, and a Greek word that's translated right away immediately. The King James, if you'll notice on the left, translated it Anon. A-N-O-N. How many uses away? Hey, come here, Anon. Did the King James translate it wrong? No, because that word in the old century meant, come quickly. They didn't translate it wrong. It's just not a word we use. So that's why in Mark 1.30 it said, but Simon's wife, mother, lay sick of a fever, and Anon, they tell him of her immediately. You'll notice that in the NSAB, ESAV, and IV, and all the other translations, they'll use the word immediately. So again, it's not a bad translation. It's just not a word you use. Here's, my, here's what frustrates me. There's some people in this church, and, and you could talk to me later. I'm not picking on you. But, like, don't hand a, a, a person who doesn't know the Bible or a new believer a King James translation. No wonder they can't understand it. No wonder they say, well, I read it, and it doesn't make any sense. I know I can't even understand it. B is the word, they use the word besom. It's in Isaiah 14, 23. I will also make a possession for the bittern, the pools of water, and I will sweep with the besom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. How many understands really what that says? Bissom. It actually means broom. I'll sweep it. I will use like a broom and sweep it. Their translation was not wrong. That's what the king, that's what the word was back in those days. But now we use the word, go back up, Jeremy, you jumped on me. But now we use the word broom, okay? Everybody with me? You see where I'm going with this? Again, if you use it and you know the words, bless, thank God you do. It's good. That's all good. Number three is the word chambering. So in Romans 13, 13, the King James Version reads, let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting, not in drunkenness, not in chambering, not in wantonness, not in strife, in envying. The actual word in the Greek would could be translated sexual, immoral, indulgence, or promiscuous, or fornication. But we never use the word, how many uses the word? Well, you got caught chambering. Is the word wrong? No. It's fine. It matches in the Greek. It's fine. That's the word. But there again, we just don't use it like that, right? And remember, this is 1611. We speak different now. Let's go on to the next one. Um, the, in Matthew 22, 46, it says, No man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. I don't even know what the word durst means. But it actually, so if, if, you, if you translate it in the Greek, it would mean the word, he dared them. And so you'll see the NSAB, SAV, New King James, and the other translations use the word dare. The NIV, the CSB, uses the word dared. Okay? Let's go on to the next one. See, here's the problem. Some old King James people will say to you, well, they just changed the Bible. No, they didn't. No, language has changed. Language has changed. It's all there. Uh, hear me out. I'm not opposed to the King James. I can, I'll read through the King James. I'm not opposed to it, okay? It's, it's all fine, but we just got to understand these things. Next word is the one is sample. So 2 Peter 2, 6 says, Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that should live after should live ungodly. So the word is example, but I hear nobody say in sample. You're a good in sample of everything that's going on. It's probably not a good word. All right, let's go on. Um, the word, um, the next one's in Jeremiah 7:33. And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven, and the beast of the earth, and none of them shall fray them away. The word means to frighten or to scare away. But they use the word fray. All right? And then you can see that it's how it's used, the word frighten in some. And then in some translations, they use the word scared. So what are, what are the right words? Well, fray is good at that point. The word frighten is a more example or fear. It, those are right words, right? Look, can I say this as I start? 
Get out of your mind that there's a word-for-word -word translation from Greek to English. There's not. And let nobody lie to you. Just like English to Spanish. If, if you ever hear anybody translate, the words are different. So you just can't say the exact words because there are phrases and there's, there's typology. And so you have syntax at the end of Greek. So in Greek, like you won't say they did this. The word they is a syntax word. So they will add words onto the end of another word that will tell them who did it. Was it you or him or they or us? Right? It can mean all sorts, but the different words at the end of the Greek do it. So you just can't translate word for word. It just doesn't work like that. So sometimes understanding what's being said and what's in context of all that's being done, it doesn't mean there, it's not great translations. It just means it's very difficult to do word for word. And I know even from Augustine when, or preaching all over, it, it, when you preach in another language, they have to use different words because they mean different things, Okay. Everybody okay? The word fellow. Uh, in 1 Kings 7, 33, it says, And the work of the wheels was like the work of a chariot wheel, and their axle trees, and their nerves, and all the fellows, and all the spokes were in molten. Well, to me, that's hard for me to understand. The word fellow is really the word rims. So, like, if I seen your car, I say, you got nice fellows on there. Nice rims, or as, as it would be laid in gold, it would be like, it would be a rim of it, right? Again, I'm not trying to be mean to the King James. I'm just laying out facts. Let's go on. This one, Luke 12, 58. When goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence to thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee in the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. The word hell, they translate, it really just means to drag or pull or to compel somebody, to force somebody to come. All right? I mean, I, have, I just had a comment on Facebook. People get mad. Why don't you use the King James? I think this is, church is a cult. And like, so this is why I deal with this stuff. Like, look, man, I, I understand you love the King James and bless your heart if you do and understand it. Good. Keep reading it. But don't say somebody's a cult because they have another translation. All right, let's go on. Um, this is a fun one for every hunter in here. Notwithstanding, this is in Deuteronomy 12, 15. Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lustest after, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he has given to thee, the unclean and the clean may eat thereof as the roebuck and as of the heart. So the word heart there is the word deer. I never hear anybody say, I'm a heart hunter. <laughs> all right? Come on. I don't want to. I probably won't go through all. Let's go to the next one, Jeremy. I'm going to go ahead. I, this may get boring a little bit. I like this one. The, uh, the word matrix, they translate as the womb. So it says, uh, everything that openeth the matrix in all flesh which they bring unto the Lord, whether it be men or beasts, shall be thine. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man shall surely be redeemed, and the firstling of the unclean beast shall thou, thou shalt redeem. Again, it's the word womb, and the King James uses the word matrix. All right, let's go on. Um, so you have nessings means snorting or sneezing. I mean, I never heard anybody, um, I'm going to sneeze, so excuse me, or like I, I'm going to nessing. Or quit nesting at night. Um, they use the word ouches for settings and exodus. Let's go on. I, I got a few favorite ones. This is, this is the most craziest one. And I have to chuckle. Because it's just goofy. Revelation 1.13 says, In the midst of the seven candlesticks, talking about Jesus in the churches, are you all right? In the midst of the candlesticks, one of, like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about, around the paps. He's got a girt around the paps. What the heck is that? <laughs> but it means he's, what, he, he's got around the breast. I don't even know what girt means. I think it means a waist, around the waist and then, and then on the chest area. So we'll leave that at that. Um, 
they, the, a lot of other words. Keep going, Jeremy. I just want to get to your scripture, and that's it. Here's the one for Jeremy. <laughs> Daniel 3, 5 says, That at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and the kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, has set up. And they translate, we really don't know what this instrument is. So to be fair, we do not know. Is it a stringed instrument? Is it like a trombone? Not sure. There's some debate on that. Of, but it doesn't matter. We know it's a music instrument, right? So, it's, so but anyway, I, I, I called Jeremy and said, do you play the sackba? It's probably really important that you do that. And put the next one up there, Jeremy, for me. And I made him there right there. No, go back up. Right there, Pastor Jeremy plays the sackba. So remember that. Um, Isaiah 3, 22. The changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the whipples and the crisping of pins. Wimples actually means like a coat or an outer garment. But it's not like, Kim, I can't find my wimple. I don't know where I laid it. Will you help me find it? <laughs> Hear me out again. I, I'm not doing this to pick on you if you read the King James. Hear me close. It's good. It's safe. You're fine. It's translated well in the context that it was translated. Are you all right? It's just old English. And if you understand old English, that's good. Praise you. But we get holy like thinking like that's how God spoke. I mean, I actually have people who will like leave church because like this is what I'm used to and this is holy. This, if, this is what I learned on Then praise God. Keep learning on it. That's fine. Right? You're good. So, so let's, let's walk down through some of the translation as they come. So what happened was, as time moves on, let me say a few things about. Um, the, they, used in the King, they used in the King James. Now, understand something. They never had all the old documents that we have now. Because of our technology and our computer, and it started when we got microfish and we started having information computers is really what blew it open but you know we have now and you can go online to this day and go find them you can go to people now who are who great professors and Tyndale's doing it some of the colleges doing it Trinity where I went does this well have their website they actually have these older pieces of the Bible that they have found like in monasteries in castles in um, people's houses that have died they have found older transcriptions of the Greek New Testament, of the Hebrew Old Testament in, in Hebrew, and they've actually found these things and matched these things up back to the 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century. They had none of that then. They only had what they had. They had. The Catholic Church had what they had. And the Eastern Orthodox Church was isolated on the other side, and so they weren't really involved with it. And it wasn't until Constantine took over that the Eastern Orthodox came over and joined with the other people what's going on. Now we can see what they've used and what they've, what they've held on to and many, and many of the truths that they've had. Does that make sense, me saying that? So, so anyway, so come in the 19th century, there were some people, and thank God, some people said, Man, we need to translate this. That we need to translate this thing into a language we can understand. How are we using these words? And so the New King James. Let's talk about it first. Many of you know I'm a New King James fan, but I'm not selling the New King James Bible. The other ones are just as good that I'm going to mention. Okay, that's just a preference for me. The New King James Version in 1979. They took. Listen to this. They went around to every big Bible school in this country, to Trinity. They went to Dallas Theological Seminary. They went to Regent University. They went to Oral Roberts University. They went to Moody Bible. They went to every big, bi every big Bible school that there was. And then they searched and they found 130, 130 Greek and Hebrew experts that they flew in from around the world and got them in the same room and said, here's the Greek transcripts that we have, and here are ones we found from 1800, and we found in 1700, and we found in 1600, and here's some that we found that are dated 4th century and 3rd century. As a matter of fact, if you would put up one of the papyri papers, are they later, just so quickly, 
So when I talk about a, a scripture in the second century or third century, remember we didn't have printing presses. There were people, so they wrote it on papyri paper. There's like there, that is John chapter 14 in the third century. You know what's cool? That matches with the same one we, that matches with the King James almost word for word. Now, not in the King James language of the old, but it translates fine. 92% of all that translation is absolutely flawless, flawless, perfected. I mean, it's proof you won't hear the media say it. But we have proof beyond a shadow of a doubt how accurate this stuff is. And the other 8% that's not right, most of it's commas or periods or misspelling of a word or maybe because maybe the document. So what do you got? You have a document. Well, you have missing letters. But when they've got, gathered them all together, they've been able to piece these things together. And they match insane. I just finished a, a Greek class with a... Um, a uh, an amazing smart man. I mean, he, his left foot is smarter than my whole body. <laughs> but, but I mean, this guy's set for years with a microfish and with this, with with these translations, and you can just watch him cry over the accuracy of reading it and how it just matches perfect. So don't buy anybody that tell you, well, somebody told the story and this changed, and somebody else told the story and this changed, and the Bible's that's a bunch of hogwash. A bunch of, there is no proof of that whatsoever. The proof is God put his scriptures in order, and they still work today, and they match. Because you know it would be front page news if they could prove it wasn't real. Front page news if they could prove it wasn't real, but they can. It's amazing to see how it works. But anyway, that's, so that's how we, we found stuff, and we go back. And when it matches, perfect. Right? So it would be like if I say something, Kim says something, and from Kim, Robin says it. But you never ever got to hear what I said. You just got to hear what Robin said. But years later, you find the quote that I made. And all of a sudden, when you heard what Robin said and the quote that I made are word for word, that says a whole lot. There was not a mess up in the translation. All right? Fair? So the New King James was 130 scholars that worked together. Listen, they took, they took all the older documents. They took the... Nestle, Island, I, I won't even go into that. They took all the Greek manuscripts, they put them together. They spent seven years meeting every third month over every single word that walked through the New Testament. Seven years, smart men and women. I mean, smart men and women on levels that I can't e even understand. Experts in the language. Then, as they begin to put it together and they wrote and they fought about it, you never get scholars together, they don't fight about a few things. But that's not normal. As they begin to do that, then they had, um, um, they had ex ex um, executive committees that the university set in. And they began to oversee those groups. It took them seven years to put the New King James translation in order, the one that you have today. It's, you can trust it that it reads right in Greek. This is why you don't even need to go back and learn the Greek language. It's right. Now... It's not word for word, so they'll give you ideas sometimes. But they attempt to go word for word. That's why it's called complete equivalence. That's, um, that's a little bit nerdy out of me. When you hear the word complete equivalence, they're saying they're trying to go word for word the best they can, okay? You're going to see a few of them that attempt to do that. Fair? So they, so they worked through this thing seven years, and they were you know, amazing, and they put this translation together. Now, when they did the New King James... They actually kept the King James close to them and tried to use the King James as a basis. So for many people who were in the King James and you love it, I recommend the, King, the New King James is very loyal to the King James translation. Very loyal to it. That's why it's called the New King James translation. Okay? All right. So um, seven years to complete all the scholars, all the work. You can go back and research it. And many of the study Bibles, they'll tell you about how they got all their... How, how they work through all their material and all that. The next one. The NASB. I, I will say this and just as a, I don't use the NASB, but it is probably the most accurate you could possibly get from the Greek. The problem is it reads hard because they were so loyal to the Greek text and they never allowed it to use some words where it would make sense to us. 
So if you want to get deep technical and a deep, deep, deep scholar will probably use this translation if he's not, if he doesn't read the Greek or the Hebrew. And so, but it is very, very difficult to read. So the NSAB was, um, the King James was put together in 1611. Then 1901, they did the ASV, which is American Standard Version. That's where they tried to translate it. It was not done well. They realized it wasn't done well. So in 1977, a... um, um, a, 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 it was called the Lockman Foundation, billionaires, decided they would take, they didn't like the King James, they weren't, they, they're not sure about the, the new King James because of the new documents they found, flew in scholars from the whole world, and they began to put this translation together. And so that's where the New American Standard Bible came from. Let's stay there for a minute, Jeremy, real quick. Um, So they did um, do an update in 1995, and they did an update in 2020. So if you get a new NASB, it's got to update. Listen to me. Why do you update it? They're not changing words. They are not changing the Greek language. And listen to me. You have Episcopalians. You have Lutherans. You have Pentecostals. You have Baptists. You have every denomination of all these guys. My professor in my Greek class that I just did sits on the NIV committee. And you ought to hear his commitment to the Word of God. And I, I sit and listen to him say in class, I'll stand accountable for eternity to try to change the Word. So even if it doesn't fit my doctrine, I don't care. i got to stay loyal to the Word that's in there. And he said, every one of us do that. And he goes, by the way, none of us would let another guy do that to the Scripture because it's more valuable than any one of us in that room. And these are men and women. It's not only men, it's women too who have learned and have grown and, and, and are experts in the language. All right? So they update because the language still changes. All right? Some people, you'll get online. I mean, you'll have people online that'll tell you this is the devil's Bible. They changed it. They use gender words that they changed, not the gender that we're talking about right now in our time. But the words like the Bible when it says, God so loved the, uh, uh, what is the verse that says man, um, which would be anthropos. And, we, you know, we get the Greek word um, anthropology, which is study of man. It's actually the Greek word anthropos. So it's anthropos, anthropos. It's, so there's this different word, but it's still anthropos. You could say that, uh, um, um, what's the translation? Um, so you use the word man. Some people will say, well, that doesn't include women. No. If they use the word anthropos as the study of man, it's like a step. Or they could use the word um, and fellows, which is the word from anthropos, and the word Philadelphia, brothers, brotherly love. All right? And they, so it may translate all humankind, just not man, just not woman. Does that make sense? So sometimes we read it, and it may say man, but it really may be, hey, women too are included in this. It's just not just man. I know one. It says, so if you have fault and you go to the altar... And you confess to the man. Do you only confess to a man? You can't confess to a woman? No, he's using the word that means all, whoever you've sinned against or whoever sinned against you. Does that make sense? So you'll have them fight this through all sorts of things. Let's go on the next one. The New International Version. So, it, so use, here's the word dynamic equivalence. All right. The NIV, let me give you the details before I move on. And I feel like I'm an expert at this. I don't use the NIV, and I'm not a big fan of the NIV. But boy, after sitting through the class of my professor, who's actually the dean of the chair right now of the NIV committee, which is pretty powerful, has really said some amazing things. But in in 1967, um, the New York Bible Society, pretty famous, decided, hey, we need to find something that's not based on the New King James or not. Or, or these other things. We need to go back and find the old Greek manuscripts and bring them in and match with what we have and then make it in a language that's readable, okay? So they gathered, um, let's see, I have, I have the detail. They had 106 scholars. It took them 10 years. 10 years, 106 guys meeting on a regular basis, working through every word um, that they would deal with. The dynamic equivalence means they didn't just take word-for-word translation. They tried to take thought-for-thought. Thought-for-thought. So in other words, they would take 
a sentence and say what in context is being said and how do we portray that thought that's being brought out but yet being reliable to the scripture okay makes sense so that's why it's called dynamic equivalence that it means it's a thought for thought translation it's a great translation. Let me say this. If you know somebody that doesn't, has never read the Bible, this is a good one to recommend. It's safe, and you're, you're using it. Keep on using it. It's good. Just understand what we're using and, and, and how we work with it. Are you okay? Um, um, again, they use the, they, they, some people get hit because they, they do the gender, the gender neutral. They're not saying a man's not a man or a woman's not a ma woman. That's not what they're saying. They're translating, is it all mankind or is it should be a man and a female? Should that be brought out that you can see that and the wording of that, okay? I don't know how deep I'm going with this. I hope that I'm not being too boring. Of, um... So let's go to the next one. I'll say this if you want. My professor's name is Bill Mounts, if you want to write his name down. Um, he has, he has uh, um, YouTube videos that are amazing. He'll tell you about their meetings that they have with NIV, and it will shock you as you hear it. And you'll have a deep respect for these men and women who have dedicated their lives. Bill Mounts, M-O-U-N-C-E. So I think it's BillMounts.com, or just put Bill Mounts on YouTube, and his videos will pop up all over the place. Now, so we have we had those translations that came out. So 1982, is that right, when the NIV first came out? Now, listen, they redo it every few years. Um, 1978 is when they started, and I think uh, 1987 was the, when the first NIV came out. Now, I think they've redone it like every, like, 10 years they redo it. And Bill gets hammered because saying, you're still changing the Bible. Why are you still meeting? And, he, and he'll give you, the, you'll hear his, his reasons of how the language changes and what they do. You okay? Um, let's talk about the next one. So they have all these translations done, and then in 1989... Tyndale, who, listen, you remember who, who was burnt for translating the Bible from Latin into English. Tyndale is a multi-billion dollar company. They, they do a lot of Bibles, and they will do a lot of Bible studies. Many of you have heard of Tyndale Publishers, fantastic group of people. But Tyndale said, you know, we found even more documents that date back that we believe we could bring out some more truth. So let's redo the, let's, let's take the NSAB, the NASB, let's take the New King James, and let's bring that together and then take an outside look at the NIV, and let's bring all these other documents, and let's bring a bunch of scholars together and put a new translation together that will even be more readable for the people. So it's called the New Living Translation. They also used a living translation that they put was not word for word in the beginning. Got to understand that. That was more of a paraphrase. But anyway... They put this together in the NLT. They had 90 scholars. They used the best. Truthfully, if you want to go back to like the first set or like the second century documents and the third, this is probably the best translation that really you get the grit of some of, of the, the thought of the early writers. And so that's called the NLT, New Living Translation. You all right? Those are the main translations I'd encourage you to use. Use any one. They're all good. You're safe with any one of them. I'm not selling any of them. And so um, now let's talk about a study Bible. So when you go buy a Bible, now look, you have translations, the King James, the New King James, the NLT, the New American Standard Bible. You have the NLT, the New Living Translation. But now you want a study Bible, something that helps you study the Bible. Before I do that, my fault, Jeremy, I missed some. I, I don't... I. I don't, I don't want to sound mean here, but there are some translations that are demonic, and I want you to understand that. You can go back and use an amplified. You can go back and use. Those are more of, of almost like a commentary. They're, paraphr they're paraphrasing the Scripture. The Mirror Bible. I love the Mirror Bible because he's, one of Alan Platt's friends wrote this thing, but he's definitely wrong in some Greek. But he doesn't say he does it word for word. He's just giving you thoughts. So you can read it, but you've got to be careful that it doesn't become, does, does that make sense? And again, none of it disagrees with Jesus as God. In his blood, we have redemption 
the forgiveness of sins, the Virgin Mary. It, that none of that changes. But when you're trying to get depth within the text. So you have the mirror Bible. You have the Amplified Bible. Has anybody in here used the Amplified Bible? Some of you use it, yeah. It's a great Bible, but man, it adds a lot of other words that aren't in there in the Greek. Is it wrong? No, it's okay. Just know what you're reading. And what do I recommend? You ought to read them all. After you've read it all in the New King James or, or in the New American Standard, maybe you ought to go back and look at it in the NLT. And they have comparison Bibles. As a matter of fact, I have every study Bible we're going to talk about, but I have comparison Bibles up here. Now, listen to me close. You don't have to buy it, but this has four translations. So if you want to get really deep, you just sit down. You can read it in all four different translations and get depth of it. If you want to get it for free, everybody likes free, right? Put the apps up real fast, if you will, for Jeremy. I'm sorry I'm a little bit out of order. The Bible Hub. Guys, I can't tell you enough about this app. It's free. And it is, oh, my. I love this thing. You could download it on your free. It has every translation you could imagine. It has commentaries. It has the pulpit commentary. And in my software that I use, Logos, that thing cost me over 1000 bucks. And you can get it for free. Like, dude. <laughs> it has tons of, it has, the, it has everything on there. There's daily devotionals you could use. It will pop up a scripture for you to read. Safe, and it's free. Just download it. And you may not do it right now because it may down, and you may not get it downloaded because it will mess us all up. But look at the little blue over in the corner. And I said this Sunday. But look at the little blue, and that, so there'll be many Bible hubs when you pop up on your, either your, iPhone or your Android, but just download the Bible Hub, Bible Hub, okay? Another one is YouVersion. YouVersion doesn't have all the other stuff, but the YouVersion is very usable. And notice this comes from some friends of ours and from Craig Rochelle. And I can't tell you how much of a hero. He pastors Life Church in Oklahoma. He's very famous. Craig Rochelle's an amazing, amazing, amazing man of God. And, uh, but Craig's best friend, who's actually I met when I was with Alan Platt one night at his house, sitting, we, we said that they, they actually, he invented to put this together, all this, and then they were going to sell it. But Craig Rochelle spent a few days fasting, seeking the Lord, and came back and said, and said to the leaders, we can't sell this. This is the word of God. God forbid we would sell it and make money off of it. He said, let's give it for free. But they had spent years doing it. And cost them hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Craig stood up, and this is, this is almost a quote word for word. Craig says, I believe if we'll give it and give the word of God, God will bless us back all the money we've invested into it. And you know, since that day, that church has blown up and God's done amazing things for that place. So it speaks for itself. So you version, I love it. I just love because I know what they stand for. But you can get all the translations for free. Okay, let's talk about some bad translations. So I, I talked to you about you have parallel translations. You have translations that are more or less commentaries. They just giving you highlights, all right? Let's talk about some bad translations. The Jehovah Witness Bible is demonic. Demonic. You won't hear me stand up and preach against other stuff a whole lot, but I'll call it out for what it is. It's demonic. Charles Taz Russell, the man that wrote this Bible, not a committee, one dude who said he was a Greek scholar. Go back and study it out. Charles Taz Russell wrote a translation. He takes the word, he takes basically what it does, it takes Jesus and demotes him to a man and says he's not God. He is a God, but he is not God. When you do that, when you remove the deity of Jesus, it's scary. Charles Taz Russell wrote this. The dude was a wacko. I'm amazed because I go to a wing place on 38th Street, and there's always people out there trying to give their translation. I, I don't want to offend anybody by saying this, but he actually taught that black people were cursed. And yet there's black people there giving away their Bibles. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, later scholars corrected, yeah, but the guy who wrote it said you were cursed. What are you doing? Like, you know, that's not God. I mean, it's crazy. They put Charles Taz Russell. I've seen the microfish. I did this in Bible school. They put Charles Taz Russell in court. In the old days, in the 1900s, if you messed with the Bible, they'd sue you. They put him in court in New York and charged him with fraud of the, of the New Testament. 
And Charles Taz Russell stood up there and said, I am a Greek scholar. I have a right to translate it. When the lawyers find out that he said that, days later they came in. The first thing in court, one day they brought it up. They put the Greek alphabet up on the board. He couldn't even say the letters of the Greek alphabet. He couldn't tell that the I was an iota. He couldn't tell that the N was a mu or the N was a nu or the O was an omicron. He couldn't even state the, the, um, um, the letters of the alphabet. How many knows don't trust him to translate it then? Or the Mormon Bible. I'm just going to state this and just state this the truth. The Mormons teach that Jesus and the devil were brothers. They were brothers of God, not God. See what it does to Jesus. Makes him not deity. Listen to me. Jesus is fully God and fully man. And don't let anybody lie to you. That's part of the mystery of God. That's what makes redemption possible. Because man can't die for your sins because man has sinned. But when they took, they said, God had two sons. They were twins. They were sitting at the table. Not twins. They were brothers. They sat at the table. And Lucifer was the bad one. And God kicked him out of the family. This is what Mormons teach. They're great people. Usually they have better families than a lot of Christians. They go to church. But they're weird. <laughs> and it's not based scripturally. That, let me tell you, when you have to have your own translation, watch out and run. Like you don't hear me tonight saying, go buy this one. This is the only one that's true. That's when you get scared. When a church guy says, we're the only church that's true, watch out. Watch out. Run. Run. But the Mormons have their own Bible. And they, I mean, there's, if Jesus and the devil are brothers, we've got, pro, we've got theological problems, man. Right? We might as well just throw it all away. None of it's true. And just forget this whole God thing. How can they be? We'll just stop there. It's important that I say that. They're altered versions. They have, there's no proof. It's all crazy. You, you know, the Mormons teach that, the Indians found that, that Joseph Smith taught that, that, that and they, they buried the, the trans, that God spoke to Joseph Smith and gave him the real translation, and he buried it in the desert, and Indians found it in the 1800. I mean, so that's the craziness that goes on. And we'll stop with there. I'm not preaching on cults tonight, but run from those translations. Yeah, the Jehovah Witnesses called the world New World Translation. New World Translation. Yeah. Um, so let's go to study Bibles. No, a study Bible just gives you, now listen, they will all run references, and, and the publishers run these references. Tyndale, Nelson, Zondervan, they're all great Christian publishers. They're all accountable, fantastic groups of people. They're the ones that print the Bibles. They will all run references, but they allow some scholars to write out study Bibles. Okay? So I have up here, and you can come at the very end of the night and look. I have up here the Life Application Bible. Now, you can get it in the NIV. You can get it in the NLT. You can get it in the New King James. That's the translation, right? But the Life Application, come, it comes from a group of Baptist people. It's um, a, a, a bunch of a good group of people that put this together and will give you some notes like tell you about the book of James at the beginning and the book of Hebrews the, and it's good you need to really need a study Bible to help you like it helps when you understand that uh, when the book of Philippians Paul was in prison writing it so before you read it if you realize Paul's in prison man that helps me understand his language right does that make sense so you have the life application good all these are good. None's bad, or I wouldn't have set them up here on the table. All right? You have the life al application. This is the Thompson chain reference next to it. You guys, and I'm not going to go deep in this. This is actually printed in, in the United States, and they hold the, the or in Indianapolis. Um, it's a Kirkbride. But they, um, this thing is filled. It has a chain reference, and they reference things. You can get lost in the references. It's good. It's fun. I've, I studied it for a year. I pounded through it. It's got some good stuff in it. Um, then up here I have the, um, the Ryrie Study Bible. This comes from um, the guy graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary, fantastic school, and um, 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 a great English professor, good. There's some great reference, so it's good. 
you have the Dakes Annoated Reference Study Bible, I wouldn't recommend necessarily. It's good. It's a little bit weird. It's annoated, so it's even more than cross-references. There are a few things that are a bit flaky on, on some maybe some racism issues that he almost crosses the line. But it's a good study Bible if you want to go study it and helps you walk through that. That's probably one of the most controversial ones that I have up here. Um, then um, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. I'm going to sell this to you. I'm not actually selling it to you. But this by far, without a shadow of a doubt, is my favorite. And I want to tell you why. I know two people that are editors on this Bible. One of them is Jerry Horner. And um, Jack Hayford, the man that put this together, is a scholar among scholars. He went to every um, um, Pentecostal, every charismatic, every person that's not deep into cessation, every Bible school, and brought, I think there were like a hundred and, I don't even know the exact number, you'd have to go back and research it. Over a hundred professors he brought together just to run references and to write some things in the scripture so you could get ideas. And their thoughts, they're not in the, they're footnotes, right? Does that make sense around it? It's dynamic. It is absolutely dynamic. And it's more complete than any other one. It has so much information in it. I personally love it. This thing, I will die loving this thing. And it's just incredible, incredible, incredible read. It will make the Bible easier to read for you because it gives you the notes. And that's why I'm trying to help you so you can read the Bible. Okay? And if you're new in here, be careful. If, like, you're going to read the Bible in a year, can I just maybe recommend this? Maybe read the New Testament over a bunch of times before you get in the Old Testament. Because sometimes Old Testament, I was reading through Jeremiah 40 last night. Just, and again, I, I, I myself say I've, I've got to make sure I read the whole Bible all the time. And I was like, Lord, this is brutal. Like you're just judging the crap out of everybody. Is there any life in this thing? <laughs> and then I was thinking, man, see, it's hard when you put a new person that doesn't know Christ reading right. So get to know the new. I believe the Old Testament. It's inspired of God. It is Jesus. Uh, it's good. But you understand where I'm going from there. So you have, we have the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. Here we have, um, how many of you know David Jeremiah? He's famous on TV. Anybody know who David Jeremiah is? David Jeremiah Study Bible. He's a quality man, amazing, smart. I don't know him, but incredible character and such character. They, so they put his study notes, his lifetime study notes in that. And so it's, it's safe, it's good, um, fantastic. Um, this one here is Tony Evans Study Bible. So let me say this. I am a fan of Tony Evans, a big fan of Tony Evans. I personally preached at a conference, at a Racism to Unity conference with Tony Evans. I know him behind the scenes, don't know him well. He wouldn't even remember who I am. But the reality of it, he is a faithful man of God. And he teaches lights out. If you want to watch somebody good on YouTube, he's somebody I recommend you watch. Go watch Tony Evans. Go watch it every week. Let's do his podcast. Fantastic. Graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. Just an amazing man. So they took his life notes and put it into a translation. It's not as deep nor as powerful to me as the Spirit-Filled Life because the Spirit-Filled Life has like twice as much information in it that's really helpful. Now, if you want to go deep, 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 deep study, you got to read a commentary. You know a commentary. They have it in the Bible. Have listened to me. The problem with a commentary is you're getting one or two men's opinion. It's good. I read commentaries. Before I preach to you guys, I'll read five or six commentaries that I love, and I'll walk through every verse. Don't think I just stand up here and just preach. I take ideas, and many times I'm like, oh, man, look, that's an amazing thought. Or like, that's terrible. <laughs> but use, if you want deep, use a commentary. You can find them on the Bible Hub. Let me say this again. The pulpit commentary is on the Bible Hub. Guys, it's lights out. It's like uh, one of the, it's, it's amazing. So you can use that. It's all for free. Jeremy, how am I doing time? Am I long-winded? Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Let's talk about this real quick. Why is the Apocrypha, should it be in our, test, old te in our Old Testament or not? Does anybody know what the Apocrypha is? If you look at the Catholic Bible and you look at a Protestant's Bible, now, let, now hear me out. What's Protestant mean? We're protesting. We're protesting that the Catholic Church held on to stuff and hid it and said man can't use it. It only got to be a Catholic priest that can do it. 
That's the problem. Do I think, I, I, I know some people who are Catholics who love Jesus. So I'm not sitting here saying Catholics are demonic or going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. A lot of it is just a religion, but there are some great men and women of God. Are you with me okay? My doctor was a, man, amazing Catholic man. And, I mean, he was on fire for God. And, let, and I mean, he was incredible, man. And he would, I'd go in there instead of taking care of my body. He's asking me theological questions. And we're but incredible people. But so, so the Protestant Bible has a set of the Old Testament. The Catholic Bible has more Bibles in it. Seven more, and we call that the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha in Latin means hidden. Okay? So somebody may ask you, well, does your, like, so if you go to an ASV translation, it will have the Apocrypha in it. And I tell you this so you know. If you have a Bible, say, whoa, well, why is, how come this book's in this one and not in that one? Because maybe it's the Apocrypha. So why do Protestants, and this is a real quick answer, why do Protestants say that the Apocrypha shouldn't be in the Old Testament? Well, my best thing to say to you is, well, what did Jesus, what Old Testament did Jesus use? Remember, he didn't have a New Testament. He had the Hebrew Scripture, right? He would go in and open the scroll. It was the Old Testament, right? So let's go there, if you'll go there for me, Jeremy. Apocrypha, seven books in the Old Testament, Catholic Bible. The word Apocrypha later means hidden away, written between 100 and 300 B.C. Notice the Dark Ages. Notice where we say there's a dark spot. This is where these history books, this contains a lot of history truth in it. So I don't even freak out if you go read it. Go read it. I just wouldn't call it inspired. Let me give you an idea of what inspired. If I wrote you a letter from the church as a pastor, you could probably count on my letter being scriptural to you. But don't think it's inspired that it's Bible. Does that make sense? God may use me to speak, but don't, it's not Bible. Because Daner can have heirs. Fair? Does that, does that make sense? This stuff has a lot of truth in it, a lot of good history in it. But So anyway, so um, let's go on. Go on, Jeremy, if you'll keep rocking through. So just watch this here. I'm going to give you how, what I believe Jesus defined the Old Testament as in Luke 24, 44 in the NIV. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written in me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Now let's stop right there. Remember, this is on the road to on, on the road when Jesus is already resurrected from the dead, and they don't even realize it's him. And Jesus said, everything that was written in the Bible in the Old Testament was written about me. And it's found in what? The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. What are those, um, what are those distinctions? Well, go on, Jeremy. Put, put our chart up there. There's our chart right there. We have the law, the first five books called the Pentateuch. Right? The Moses and, and people around Moses that wrote. By the way, man, there have been some discoveries in the 1900s. Of they, in Egypt, they just found some plates that they're actually dating back to like close to when they say that Moses could have probably had somebody writing on these plates. Is that, I mean, amazing stuff. Archaeology is like blowing it up of like just proving the Bible's true. Because they said for years, well, we have no proof, we have no proof. They've dug far enough, now they're finding it all over the place. So anyway, so you have the five first books of the Pentateuch. Then you have the other prophets, Joshua, Judges. Notice, notice, one Samuel and two Samuel, okay? One Kings, two Kings. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12. Those are the minor prophets, Hosea, Haggai, Zechariah, okay? So then you have the, um, you have what's, what's called the Psalms or called the, um, 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 go back, go back to the scripture before, what did Jesus label it? And I'm messing it up. Yeah, he called it the Psalms there. So these are what's labeled. Now listen, this is Jewish historical fact. I'm not giving you something. I mean, this is what the Jews will tell you when you use it. So these are the Psalmetic books, Job, Proverbs, Ruth, Song of Solomon, Lamentation, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, notice. Ezra and Nehemiah. Notice they got one book there, one and two Chronicles, okay? All right, let's go on, Jeremy. Now, I've got to show you the Hebrew Old Testament versus our Old Testament because on the front they look different, but they're not. you got to hear me out. Do you know our Bible is not in chronological order? Just because Ephesians comes before Philippians doesn't mean Ephesians was written before Philippians, not at all. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are not in chronological order. Luke was done way later. 
all right? And some of the books are like way out of chronology. It doesn't matter what. It doesn't, it, does it matter? Not really. So anyway, so the Hebrew Bible, now I can't get them all. Jeremy and I worked hard on doing this, and I'm sorry I can't do this. We tried so hard. But the Hebrew Bible, over on the left, you'll see, just scroll down. Just stay, uh, pay attention to the left. Keep going, Jeremy. All the books in the Hebrew Bible, keep going. It stops there at Chronicles, all right? 35 books in the Hebrew Old Testament. You all with me? Is this making sense? I don't want to get move past you. 35 books. If you go back on the right side to the uh, English Old Testament, if you'll go there for me, Jeremy, you'll see he starts out and he walks through and then go down to the bottom. There's 39. Uh-oh. Did we miss out some scripture? What's in the Hebrew Old Testament? What, what don't we have? Or what did we add? Did we add something to? No, we didn't add anything to it. So count this out with me, all right? Look on the left side at number 34. Stay right there, Jeremy. 34. Go down more. Right there. Stop. Number 34. Ezra and Nehemiah. They count those books as one. We count it as two. So add number 36 over here. All right? You with me? Let's go up. Look at two, one Chronicles and two Chronicles. They count them as one book. Add 37. Go to one Kings, two Kings. They count them as one book. Add a book in ours. What? 38. Another one there's. And look at the next one. One Samuel, two Samuel. They count it as one book. 39. 39 books. Perfect. You all right? Theirs is in chronological order. Ours is not. Important fact. All right? Notice the order of the Old Testament. Go back up real fast, Jeremy. Thank you for doing this, Jeremy. The Hebrew Bible starts in Genesis. In, now go down all the way to 36, 35. Notice what the last book is. One Chronicles and two Chronicles. So if they're in order, it's two Chronicles would be the last, last book in their order, right? Now this will make sense. Let's go on. Uh, click on up, Jeremy, if you will. Now let's read Luke 49. Oh, uh, Luke. Uh-oh, Jeremy, we don't have the passage in there. Is it Luke? Uh, um, we need to find that, Jeremy. Push, um, or somebody just uh, put, somebody, do you know how to use a commentary or a, um, like an exhaustive concordance, and if anybody has the U version, just put the word um, generation in there, and then it will type all the words generation. We need to find what scripture this is. We'll move on, but I'll, I'll give you the passage of scripture. But this is Jesus speaking, okay? You with me? Jesus speaking. Jesus says, go back up, Jeremy, right there. But, but of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them the prophets and the apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Verse 50. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that's been shed from the beginning of the world. Verse 51, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. When was Abel's blood shed? Genesis, first book. When was Zechariah's blood shed? At the end of two chronicles. My suggestion to you would be that Jesus just labeled the Old Testament from the beginning to the end. The blood of every man that's been spilled of the prophets from Abel to Zechariah. He just gave us right there what was in the Old Testament. Every blood of the prophets that had been spilled. There were blood spilled of so-called prophets in the um, uh, Apocrypha. But why didn't Jesus list them? Why wouldn't have he said that? Let's read on here if you will. So the, last, the first man killed in Scripture and the last man. Let's go on, January, to the next passage. 2 Chronicles 24. And here it is. Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jodiah, the priest, who stood before the people and said, This is what the God says. You who disobey the Lord's commands will not prosper because you've forsaken the Lord and he's forsaken you. But they plotted against him by the order of the king, and they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. There it is right there. That's when Zechariah was killed. So again, that's my suggestion on the Apocrypha, okay? It's deep. You can study it. I hope that's not too boring. Let's move on. 
Everybody say, Phew. <laughs> If you want to leave, you feel free to be dismissed if I'm boring the heck out of you or if you got... I, what I do want to suggest to you, and Steve, you can't go anywhere, though. <laughs> Don't forget at the end, come up and look at some of the stuff. And, and they're up here so you can filter through and piece through a little bit, all right? Let's talk about the translation and, and how we got the translations, okay? I love this stuff. I'm way nerdy, so excuse me if I get weird. And, I, and Jeremy, I need a clock so I get done on time. <laughs> we just lost the name of the church, so that's fine. <laughs> Can you count on the document of the New Testament? I've sitting there and told you how. Now I'm going to show you why I believe you can. Well, first, we have prophecy. I mean, it's amazing to see the prophecy right that fulfills. I mean, how is it that God said in the town of Bethlehem, like Claremont, a virgin would have a baby? In Claremont? Like, it's incredible, the, all the prophecy of Scripture. I mean, hundreds of prophecies that are still being fulfilled to this day. Archaeological digs are incredible way over my head and it's boring to me but oh my gosh it's incredible when they find it all out I mean I don't like going in a bunch of rocks and digging but they found amazing stuff we have um, and I'm going to show you some early church fathers I'm going to talk about some reason finds in the, in the computer so number one the textual reliability chart if you write that down you'll be able to find this all over you can google it to match so, so you'll know that I'm just not giving you a bunch of poop go search it Textual reliability chart. All right? The, so, do you have something before that, Jeremy? Is that it? Okay, yeah, you're good. I'm sorry. Keep going. We're good. Let's go down to the chart, Jeremy, and just skip those. No, let's go back. That's Sean McDowell's. <laughs> Let me do this for you. We appreciate you, Jeremy. This book right here is by Josh McDowell, by Sean McDowell, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you're into this stuff, buy it, my friends. This is incredible, incredible. Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It has all the details. You'll find these charts and details, studied, proven facts. I mean, this thing's got archaeological stuff, and this book is lights out. His dad did it years ago, and then now Sean's doing it. Sean's a professor at Biola University, incredibly smart guys. Um, well, we'll talk about that here in a minute. There, there's the book right there, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. You can take a picture of it if you, want, if you like reading this stuff. Some of you get you excited, and some of you say, oh, my God, get me out of that. So it's fine. Let's go back here. So let's go back to the chart. Go down to the chart. No, I said I was going to read it. We have Greek manuscripts. Listen, that, that means they put them together in their full form. We have 5,856 Greek manuscripts in their full form, all the way running back that we have documented that run through in order, and the things match, as I told you, 92% perfect, perfect. There may be, in, in the 8% that's messed up, a spelling, a missed letter, a missed word, not one, not one of them ever deal with any theological truths like the virgin birth. Not one of them deal with, was Jesus God? None of that stuff. It's all just goofy little things. Well, was there a comma there? Or was there an extra word? Or should that be plural? But that's part of translation problems, right? I mean, you have that. But we keep finding all the stuff that even proves beyond a shadow doubt this thing. So we have 5,000. The earliest manuscripts in A.D. 130. Think about it. 130, we have documents of the New Testament 130. You know when the disciples are dying? 100. 30 years later, we have proof of that written out. Dude, if they're lies, somebody was a friend of one of those, of, of those apostles to say, that's not true. You're writing lies. They were there. They were where, this like, if I die and 20 years later, somebody says, well, Daner was, said that the Mormon Bible was truth. Somebody in here that's to be alive could say, well, that's not true. That's not what he said. That's a lie, right? So 130 A.D. The non-Greek manuscripts, Armenian, Latin, there are 8,130 New Testament Bibles. 
in all sorts of different languages. Nambia. By the way, if any person tries to say, we have all sorts of translations from Nambia. Nambia is northern Africa. Nambia was proven a dark-skinned people. And so anybody says, well, the Bible is, it, 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 it's, it's a white man's religion. Are you crazy? There were revivals that broke out in the 100 ADs in Nambia among all black people. The Bible is for every race, tribe, tongue, and nation. Don't let anybody tell you that it's a white man. God was moving there before there was a bunch of white men around. All right? Anyway, so we have a total of 23,986. Now, can you imagine that 92% of that match is perfect? Very incredible. Let's read on. Here's what he says. How do the New Testament documents compare with other ancient books? A stack of existing manuscripts from average classical writer could measure up to be about four foot. And we're going to talk about who those guys are in a minute. All of them that you learned in English and they teach today would stack up about four feet high. Yet the New Testament manuscripts would stack up to more than one mile high. You know how high one mile is? A long way. So let's go to the chart. You'll see the different text. So, Jeremy, um, um, can you, um, to the left, make that bigger. Just, just crank it, like, I don't know, 300% or whatever. How many knows I owe Jeremy something for doing all this stuff and tolerating me today? You better hurry or I'm calling you out. Put it up a little bit. Can you move it to the center? Actually, he's very good at this stuff. He'll get it. All right. So we have, so how many of you have heard of Homer or Lilliad of, 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 of writings? Boom. Ooh, better. Now can you scoot it over? <laughs> there you go. Right up. Yeah, there you go. Homer Lilly. Thank you, Jeremy. So notice this. We have 26,000 documents of the New Testament. And the earliest, and, and so look, Homer and Liliad, they have 663. Um, look at Aristotle. How many of you know we teach Aristotle's truth? We only have 69 documents of his. Why is it I don't hear anybody say, Aristotle's a lie, but the Bible, or Aristotle's truth, but the Bible's a lie? Well, how's that? We got a whole mile full of documents, and they only have 69 of Aristotle. How do we know he's true? Right? Or you have Tactius, or Caesar. How many of you have, know, have heard of Caesar? We only have 10 documents that are... That are um, Let's see, the copies and the early, yeah, the, the copies, so 10. You have um, all of them. So you go down to Pliny or Plato. I don't know why those have, um, I don't, I'm not even sure why they have questions. I don't want to fill that out. But anyway, the reliability of the, old, of the New Testament is incredible. We have so many documents, so many documents proving that it's true when it's real. Now, here's the big lie. This is what I love. I'm deep into this stuff. I hear people say, well, we really don't know what books should be in the Bible because there was a committee that voted a, a, in the 300 A.D. voted on putting the Bible, and they call it the canon, right? What books were inspired? Because you've all heard of lost books of the Bible. And listen, History Channel's a liar. History Channel, I bring all these things up. Were those books written? Of course they were written. But none of them were written in the first century. They were all written later on by crazy people. I mean, you can go back and read some crazy... I mean, they got the book called Adam and Eve. You know where the Quran got... Because the Quran, when, when Muhammad had this dream and said that God gave him all this vision, he was also reading from lost books of the Bible. That's the reason they have the weird stories of Jesus, like when Jesus was 12 years old, a bird fell off of a story of, of off the top story of a house, and Jesus went down and healed the little bird. Well, 
Well, he got it from the lost books of a Bible from a crazy writer who had stupid, stupid stories. So how do I know if they voted on 300? I'll tell you right now. The apostles knew what books were real and what books were written and had planned it and knew in order. The problem was they didn't have a printing press, nor were they writing all of it down in detail because they were living it. Now hear me out. Hear me out. So let's talk about these books. What should be? Should the New Testament books be there? Are they, are they right? Are they in order? I guess the best way to go tell, let's see what people said. So John had two disciples. We know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. John had two disciples that were, became famous that we call early church fathers. And see, we're scared of the church, early church fathers because the Roman Catholic Church venerates them. They say they don't worship them. They say venerate. I don't know the difference, but... The Greek Orthodox does the same thing. And I'm a fan of some Greek Orthodox stuff. But they do the same thing. So when you go in, you got to, like, have a sacrifice for them and some weird stuff that goes on. But one of, the, one of the very first disciples of John, the Apostle John, if you will, um, oh, there's our translations. Anyway, let's go. So one of the first guys, his name was Polycarp. I don't know if you ever heard of him, Polycarp. Let's go down to Polycarp's um, script, um, New Testament, or the book that he wrote. I won't read Jared Williams. I think you'll have to go on, Jeremy, the next one. Early Church Fathers is the document. So Polycarp, we have one letter that's in multiple forms, but we have one letter that is documented that we know for a fact. He wrote a letter to the Philippian church. All right? I want you to listen, listen to me. Polycarp's not, it's not, it's not, it's like Dana writing a letter. He was John's disciple, so I guarantee you he's telling you truth, a lot of truth. But it doesn't mean he's inspired by God, right? But listen to what Polycarp does as he writes the letter, the only letter we have by him. Um, keep going, Jeremy. I just want Ignatius. We'll go through Ignatius here in a minute. Ignatius was also another disciple. Um, keep going. Then we'll go right back there. There's Polycarp. He was, he, he was born in, 19, in 69 A.D. and one, died in 155. So he was alive during, through this whole time with John. So John probably led him to the Lord and raised him as a man of God, right? And then we know that Polycarp became the bishop or became... Now listen, don't freak out by the term bishop. The bishop is probably a term we should be using. Because it does... You know, the word pastor is only used one time in the New Testament. It's the Greek word poimen, and it really means a shepherd, not pastor. And we've, like, Americanized these words that we get weird. But a bishop was like an overseer of a group of churches. Polycarp was in Smyrna. And if you realize that you read in Revelation, Smyrna was a persecuted church. I mean, these people are dying for their faith. And Polycarp was one of their leaders. So Polycarp writes this. Yeah, the bishop of Smyrna. Um, we have one recorded book. Let's, let's go on to his book. Chapter 1. Um, I, so here's what he says. I have greatly rejoiced with you in our Lord Jesus Christ, just as you follow the example of true love as displayed by God and have accompanied as become of you those who are bound in chains, the fitting ornaments of saints, which are indeed the diadems of the true elect of God and our Lord. And because of the strong root of your faith spoken in the days, and he quotes Philippians 1.5, Long gone by, endures until even now, and brings forth fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ. For who our sins suffered even unto death, but God whom God, but whom God raised from the dead, having loosed from the bands of the grave, in whom you now see him not, you believe, and believing rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. 1 Peter 1 8. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to quote almost every New Testament book that we have. And he's not going to quote one that's not there. Pretty weird. Or is it? I would suggest to you, now listen, I, you can go back through, through 500. These guys knew what was going to be in the two. They knew what letters were inspired of God. They knew what the New Testament canon was. It wasn't a bunch of people that just got in a room and voted. Well, let's put this one in. They knew. It was clear. Polycarp reads on. I love this. Polycarp reads on. Into the joy many desire entering, knowing the grace which you are saved, not of works, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but the will of God through Jesus Christ. 
Then in chapter 2, he says, Wherefore, girding up your loins, 1 Peter 1, 3, Ephesians 6, 14, serve the Lord in fear and in truth. If those who forsaken, do you notice how he's quoting all the New Testament books? What incredible. Let's go down, Jeremy, if you will. Um, it gives the numbers. I think I did. Uh, no, I have Iranus. So you'll have to go back. I think he quoted, um, boy, I don't even want to say because I miss, not every New Testament book was quoted, but almost every one was quoted. Let's go back to Ignatius, who was also a disciple of John. Are you with me? I hope you guys are right. I'm just not nerding you out, stupid, crazy. But to me, this, like, like man, I, I, so I'm not going to buy that thing. Well, they're just voted on by a bunch of guys. Baloney, they knew. How'd they, how they do this? How they, them guys knew what was inspired. Ignatius was the, bird of, bird, um, of the bishop of the church of Antioch, of Syria. He was martyred by Trajan in 110 A.D. So notice... He's alive, right? Uh, John just got done dying for the, in the, writing the book of Revelation and just got done dying being burned to death. This was his disciple. So he writes, uh, let's go on. So he, uh, um, he wrote seven letters. Um, um, so let's go on, um, Jeremy. So look at this. Here's out of the seven letters, look what he does. He quotes Matthew four times in direct quotes. And eight times illusions, that means he gives a reference. He paraphrases it, but references that scripture. So he obviously believed Matthew was inspired, or why would he write Matthew? Right? I mean, we don't have him saying, Philip, Philip chapter 2, verse, don't have him saying anything like that. He only quotes New Testament books. He says, uh, Matthew, four direct quotations. Luke, one clear illusion. John, one direct quotation, six illusions. Romans, three direct quotations, three illusions. 1 Corinthians, three direct, direct quotations, ten illusions. 2 Corinthians, one direct quotation. Galatians, two illusions. Ephesians, two direct quotations, two illusions. Philippians, and look at the books that he, that he so Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2, Tim, 2 Timothy, and 1 Peter. And not one book that's not there, nor was one what they would call a lost Bible ever in any of these writings. Why not? Because they knew it wasn't real. Not even saying it wasn't real, just it's guys that are not inspired by God. So let's uh, go up, Jeremy, to, um, so we did Ignatius, we did Polycarp. Let's go back to the next one, then I'm done with these guys. Here's Irenus. He was a disciple of Polycarp, so a third generation. So John discipled Polycarp, Polycarp's main disciple who Polycarp turned everything over to, like the next pastor of the church, the next bishop, was a guy called Irenus. Look at this. Scholars contend for, uh, that Irenaeus quotes from 21 of the 27 New Testament books. How is it that he quoted from these New Testament books and not one that's outside the New Testament? Do you not think these guys knew? They knew. Can I tell you something? I believe you can trust this book. If God's real, you can trust that this book is truth. And it's still a number one seller for a reason. Proof is it's still coming to pass. It's still the number one seller. It's still the number one seller. People have died for it, and it has still changed lives today. We still preach it, and people still get saved. People still get healed. People still get changed. Drug addicts get set free. Alcoholics get set, set free. People's lives be changed and touched. It lives on and lives in through us. It's the living word, alive and powerful. The New Testament book is very clear about quoting itself and loving on itself. God bless you guys. I'm done here in one minute. Thank you guys. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, um, yeah, I'm just going to be done there. What time is it? Oh, my gosh. I've been a long time. I'm so sorry. I pray. So listen, the Bibles are up here for you to look at if you want one. If you've got a question, I may answer it tonight. I may not know it, but... Um, I'm willing to hang around, answer a little bit. And my prayer is this, get in the Word and read it. Study it, study it. I pray you take some things tonight that I taught and dig in it, but you can trust it. It's real, it's alive. The New Testament's a document that you can base your life on. It's God's Word. Father, speak to Him, have your way, God. and um, um, Just speak to Him, God. Use Him, God. We're just believing for a move of God. Even as we spoke on Sunday in New Exodus, God. Move us, God, into a new place, revival to flow in the hearts of people, let lives be touched and changed, and strengthen us 
as we disciple, and we'll give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Everybody said, get ready for Sunday. We're going to do something we've never done before. It's going to be a fun Sunday. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry I went so long. I apologize.